Dr. Bruton Foster um, before I came to Downstate. And so sometime during my tenure at Brooklyn Health Disparity Center, this lady came, her name was Carla Bruton Foster, and we sat down and we had this discussion that literally, I mean, the, by the time we were both finished, we knew we didn't need to meet too often because the ideas were just banging off of, you know, off of the walls. Um, and she's a dynamo. So I am just so thrilled and pleased to know her. And um, her presentation is going to be dynamic just because that's the way she is. And so I invite Dr. Carla Bruton Foster. And I also want you to know she's a part of transport and really it's because of her that today exists. She thought we weren't going to do it, but we do. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Straker. And we also became close friends because we both like to shop. So I was on jury duty in August, and I said, Pam, we're on break for an hour. <laughs> what do I do? And then she sends me a list of stores um, downtown Brooklyn to go shopping, so thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. So, um, Translational Program of Health Disparities Research Training Program, Transport. Um, so I'm going to discuss um, with you a particular um, area of interest that I have that is biomedical research diversity. Okay, so the mission, right? What is transport? The mission of transport is to provide a foundation at SUNY Downstate for growing and developing a diverse biomedical research workforce that's going to position us at SUNY Downstate to be national leaders in translational research, health disparities, and population health research, and ultimately to really contributing to addressing some of the health inequities and social determinants that contribute to um, poor health in our community. And transport is designed to develop the infrastructure to make this happen, right? But for in order for us to, in order for us to reduce health disparities, we have to develop an infrastructure that can accelerate the pace with which discoveries are made. We have to translate these discoveries into evidence-based, patient-centered, effective therapies that resonate and align with the goals of, and priorities of the community. And we really have to pay attention to the community's needs. And that's why understanding the social determinants is critically important. And having a research biomedical workforce that understands this, that can go with and work with the communities and develop research with the communities and research that aligns with community priorities and that really community um, um, researchers who really understand what's at stake. So as Dr. Straker said, we also have to foster trusting community partnerships and lastly, build and sustain this diverse biomedical research workforce, right? So how do we go from here, here, to here? These are my kids. <laughs> oh, they, this is about 20 years ago. Um, my, my, my oldest son, Jordan, is at Oxford studying clinical psychology, and Justin um, is at LaGuardia High School, and he wants to be um, the next Steven Spielberg, Donald Glover, you name it, a movie producer, right? But something happened from here. Something happened. So um, I'm, I'm a physician. I'm, um, I went to SUNY Downstate. My husband's a physician. And my father-in-law is a doctor, right? But we thought they were interested in the sciences. Actually, Jordan is. Jordan is interested in clinical psychology. and He's interested in research. But if you ask them about medicine, ooh, yuck, no, not medicine. And I'm like, why not? And he said, mom, all you do is come home, you talk about your patients, your residents, your dean, and, a cha and your chair. Who talks to their chair all day? What is your chair saying to you? So he never really understood why, like, why was I always talking about this chair, right? So I don't know if it's something that Jordan and I did to make them lose interest. Right? But somewhere, this is maybe six and 10, and somewhere between here and high school, 
They lost interest in science. They were still interested in education because they knew better that you do not live at 1224 Dittmas Avenue unless you're in school, right? All right, you know, and, and, then, and then if then, then you're moving out, right? Um, but no, but that was just the rule. You can stay here as long as you're in school or, you know. Um, so they knew they were going to college, they knew that. But this whole idea of science was like, yuck, ew, no, I don't want to do science. I hate science. And I don't know what happened. I honestly don't know what happened. And then again, my kids are great. I, I'm really blessed to have them. They're, they're really fun kids. But I, I, I sort of feel like, what did I do to make them have this almost disdain for science? Like, what, what, what happened, right? So this, um, my older son, Jordan, went to Stuyvesant High School. And he was one of four young black men in his school, in the school, the entire school of, of like, what, 700, 800? And he went in loving science. I mean, he went to Stuyvesant, right? He went out hating science, hating, 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 hating it. This one right here wanted so much to be like Jordan that anything that Jordan hated, he hated. Jordan hated broccoli, he hated broccoli, right? Right? Jordan hated DC, he hated DC. Jordan loved the Avengers, and this is for you, Dr. Reinhardt. We had this discussion about Avengers. He, he loved Avengers, right? So anything that Jordan wanted to do, he hated, right? So we were stuck here, right? But then how do we move from here to here, right? These are two of our fellows, um, Dr. Ojini and Dr. Sola. They're in a program, a faculty development program known as ECRIP. And then how do we get from here back to here so that they're supporting these kids, right? So that's what I, I, I want to um, talk about. So we know that there is a gap in the number of women and underrepresented minorities who remain in STEM fields. And this comes from the NSF that shows that, as you see from this slide, the majority of, 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 of people who are in entering STEM engineering fields, science fields, are white men with about 18% women uh, four percent black women and, and Hispanic or Latino women, and about seven percent black men and twenty-one percent Asians. Right. So how do we? How do we? What? How, what are we doing? How do we address this? Well, the literature shows that the literature does show that early exposure, participation in undergraduate research programs significantly increases the intention to enroll in a STEM program. And this early exposure may do what um, social scientists call developing um, science identity, right? You identify with science. You like science. You understand the language. You begin to speak the language. You begin to, to, um, to sort of uh, uh, hang around with a social network that sort of reinforces this. You see yourself as a scientist. You see yourself as a researcher. You see yourself as a nurse. You see yourself as a physical therapist. You see yourself as a physician. You have to see yourself, right? So this science identity, and by seeing yourself, you do the things to develop confidence, to develop self-efficacy. So this, this frame here talks about persistence, right? Early exposure, active learning, learning communities will help to support the science identity and this learning of the science will help to promote, to increase confidence, motivation, right? And continue it, right? So early exposure is critically important. So this is, this brings us to transport, um, the SPRINTER program. So SPRINTER stands for Summer Program in Translational Disparities and Community Engaged Research. So what is SPRINTER? Sprinter is a program that provides undergraduate, underrepresented minorities and women with an opportunity to gain this early exposure that we've been talking about. The underlying philosophy is that we believe that early exposure leads to increased interest and persistence. And the long-term goal is persistence, pursuing graduate training, pursuing a terminal doctorate degree, and NIH funding. And I say NIH funding because this is an NIH grant. But other funding, of course, is, is, of course is important. Foundation funding, RWJ funding, HRSA funding, funding, right? But for the NIH, they want to see that we're creating a pipeline that's going to contribute to more NIH funding. So who are our partners? Uh, we were really fortunate. Like, we, I think we, Betty, we, we got notice of award in like August, September or something. And then right around, um, was it December, we said, oh, <laughs> we have to do something. We have to develop a program. We have these objectives. We have a progress report, you know, because we, we were all basking in this, like, we got $10 million, yay, but now we actually have to get to the work of doing something. Um, so we, we called our friends 
um, doctors, um, Shell and Diaz from Albany. I don't know if they're still here. They're upstairs. Oh, okay. So Dr. Shell and Dr. Diaz, um, we call our colleagues um, from, 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 from Brooklyn College, Dr. Blackman and Dr. DeBoers, I think. Oh, I'm sorry, Medgar Evers, Dr. Blackman and Dr. DeBoers, right? And, and from Brooklyn College, Dr. Um, Gail Horowitz and, and Heinlein. Um, and I, I think Dr. Ogunwambi and, and Dr. Skeet were also from Medgar's, right? So if you can raise your hands, thank you so much. Raise your hands, don't be shy. <laughs> These are our, our colleagues and friends from Medgar Evers. Um, and we called on them and said, let's make this work. Let's make this work. So remember Dr. Stryker was talking about community, right? Always going back to the community. Here we are, the only um, medical school in Brooklyn, and we have some great academic institutions that we need to partner with in Albany, Brooklyn College, and, and Medgar Evers. We can walk to Medgar Evers. We can walk to Brooklyn College also. Walking to Albany might take a little longer. But we do have this great community that we really, with tremendous resources that we need to leverage, right? So we leveraged our existing partnerships. We um, established a working group to identify what the program would look like. We developed um, selection criteria. And each institution was asked to identify a student who they felt would benefit the most from the program. And the reason we did this was because we wanted to get started quickly. The first year was five students. And each year would increase by five to year, year five, we would have 25 students moving forward. So this first year, we asked each school to identify at least two students. Um, and we would look at, you know, from this cohort of about like um, um, six to 10 students, select five. So um, the eligibility was for rising sophomores who are in good academic standing. And we didn't put it, actually, initially we had a number there. And some of our colleagues said that some students are entering college and they're not meeting this threshold. And it's no fault of their own. I mean, if we go back to, you know, how my sons just fell out of love with science. So, you know, to no fault, these are hard working students. Some students who are working two jobs. These are hard students. These are the students we want to work with and make an investment in, right? Um, but so we had to uh, not, not take shortcuts. Really, I, you know, I don't think we, we were lowering the bar. In fact, we were raising the bar because we wanted the students who were first generation um, immigrants uh, working two or three jobs. Um, no one in their family has been to medical school or, base, or, or has a nursing degree. Those are the students. So we, in essence, we, were really, we talk about like lowering the bar, but we we're really raising the bar. If you can do all that and maintain a good GPA and you demonstrate that you're really interested in science, then we want you. And we came across with this idea based on speaking with our partners. So the length of a program was seven weeks, seven scheduled Monday through Fridays, nine to five, and they were um, um, given a stipend. So the didactic components, we had health disparities lectures, introduction to biostats, and journal club, community-based organization visits, SUNY Albany visits, and mentored research project. So um, the health disparity, the didactic component was inquiry based. So we basically modeled it on what the medical students are doing. So the medical students, I don't know if we have medical students here. Raise your hand, don't be shy, right? So they have this, this inquiry base where they're given a case and they go about asking questions relevant to the case, and that's how they learn. And this is how we taught this summer because, um, you know, I said, well, I don't really want to give a talk on cardiovascular disease, mental health, diabetes, and sickle cell. I don't want to stand there and lecture. You know, I'll give you a case. You know, patient presents with chest pain, shortness of breath. What do you think is going on? Um, they tell you that they have a family history. Why is that important? What do you do? What do you tell them and why? So they have to research this and present and work in groups. And these, um, as you see, these topics align with what Dr. Salafu said before, the thematic theme of, of transport. So we wanted to make sure that at the end of the day, there's a thread that underlines what we're doing in transport. Um, OK. OK. So then um, they had an intro to research methodology and statistics. Is Ms. Jay there? Yes. So Tina, raise your hand. Um, so she taught biostats to the students. Basically, she taught them data collection choosing the right test, interpreting your result, presenting your results, and visualizing your data. So basically, she said, Give me, bring me all of your data. Just bring them to me. Look at them. You know, Tina likes to say, there's a story behind these numbers. What are the numbers saying to you? Like, talk to the numbers. Talk back to them, right? And students were coming in like, the numbers are talking, but I don't know what they're saying. <laughs> Right? So we wanted them, and that's the, 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 the aspect of science identity, 
that you own it. You have to own what you're doing. All right, so we wanted them to own this experience and talk the data. <laughs> Um, so going back to what Dr. Straker was saying, community, so Arthur Ashe, so we had site visits. We wanted them to understand that the health disparities that they're reading and studying about are not occurring in a vacuum. And also to look at it from an asset-based perspective, um, perspective, that there are assets in the community. A lot of times, oftentimes, we talk about disparities as if the community is just sitting there waiting for us to come and save them. We're in, 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 the truth is that there are a lot of community organizations that are actively engaged, building capacity. You know, they've been doing it before we got here, right? So we had them meet with members of the Arthur Ashe Institute, the Caribbean Women's Health Association, they went to SUNY Albany, um, and the Department of Health. They actually had a mental health first aid training. Um, so the mentored research program. So this was the fun part, um, where the students actually got to collect their own data and analyze it. Now, a lot of these projects were not new projects because we only had our students for seven weeks. So these, these were projects that were ongoing that they took a part in, right? So this was, so I said we had five students. So we selected five students, but one student wasn't able to participate. And then this student just like shows up. <laughs> um, she was working with one of the faculty members here and the faculty said, uh, I have a student, she's really great. I'm not quite sure what project to put her on. We're like, well, let's see what we can do. And it just worked out that um, we, we, so we have the students. So she's from Spelman. Um, so, so our students um, uh, are, are from different schools. So Adia Benjamin is from Spelman. Jorge Lata is from Brooklyn College. And Abira Khalid is from Medgar Evers. So they worked on a project that looked at study, a study to reduce sodium intake. And this was their slide. This is the first page of their PowerPoint slide that they created. Um, and their project focused on measuring psychometric properties of a dietary adherence scale in end-stage renal disease. So they had to read about end-stage renal disease. They had to understand what were the psychometric properties of a survey, of a scale. Then they had to look at, you know, again, we, we, we have numbers, right? What's the, what are, what's the story? that the numbers are trying to tell us, and that can be best told in the context of what patients are actually telling us. So they also had to analyze qualitative data. And the students did an amazing job. Um, Dr. DeBoers and Blackman, Abira did an amazing job. And I wish we had, you know how they have like TV bloopers? We actually have videos of them preparing for this talk, and it was like, Abira Kali, take 16, <laughs> because we had to do it over and over again. You know, you remember when we did it upstairs um, in, the, in the video? And we, were, we, we videotaped them talking, and then we showed them. And I'm like, this is what you look like when you talk. Are you OK with this? If someone were to you know, bust in here and take this and put this on CNN or Fox, well, CNN, what would you want them? <laughs> Let's bring it back. <laughs> what would you, what, what, how would you feel, right? right? This is you on television. Are you OK with that? And we spent a couple of hours rehearsing, going through the talk. So that's, um, these are these, these students. Um, Chris DeRosen. So Chris worked with Dr. Michelle Patu and her team looking at endorsement of mental health symptoms in African Americans. And Chris came in, and he wanted to be a physical therapist. What? Physician assistant? Physician assistant. Thank you, Tina. And he said he wanted to do, he was interested in research, he wanted to become a physician assistant, but wasn't quite thinking about research. And then he left the program saying, he's actually thinking about getting a research doctoral degree to go along with his, uh, being his, a physician assistant. All right? so he actually started thinking about this. Um, um, this is Janessa. Where is Dr. Reinhardt? Janessa. Janessa is a student from Albany, so she looked at the association between frailty and dementia. We could not get Janessa to we could not get her to talk. She was, she was extremely, extremely intelligent. I mean, just, I mean, all of the students are extremely intelligent. But Janessa basically said, I do not like talking. You're not going to make me talk. <laughs> she was like, that's that, right? But when you ask Janessa a question, she explained it. I mean, she understood Alzheimer's. She understood frailty. And we had to do several takes to get her to feel comfortable. And it goes back to that confidence, right? If we give her the confidence that she can do it, and then we show her the slides, the takes, 
Um, this helps to instill the confidence and the self-efficacy to do it the next time. So Janessa's talk was just amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Reinhardt. I mean, she, she blew it out the box. She really did a great, and this was very complicated. There was a lot of data. Um, some of the data had been collected, not all of it. So she, she did a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful talk. And thank you, Dr. Um, Reinhardt, for really working with Janessa. Um, this is Jaylene Paredes. Um, so Jaylene is a student at Brooklyn College. She looked at comparisons of live births between African-American women and schizophrenia and those without um, the disease. And she did a terrific job. Jaylene, I think, was one of the students who came in. I mean, she, I think like the numbers were speaking to her out loud because she was in the office almost every single day. I'd walk in, I'm like, hi, hi, Jaylene, right? She actually came back. After the program ended, she came back. I'm like, Jaylene, the program's over. You do know that, right? But she came back and she actually worked with Dr. Patu. Like, I would see her on the bus. And I'm like, is this woman following me? And she's like, no, I'm like, where are you going? She's like, I'm going to Dallas. I'm like, the program ended like two weeks ago. She's like, no, no, I'm still working with Dr. Patu. And I actually think she applied, and I don't even know if she did get received. The, was it Mark? Right? So she, after this, she came back. She, she got it? She, she applied for a program, NIH Mark um, program, which is to, to develop careers in underrepresented minorities in undergraduate schools and, and received this. So after this program. So this was a great program. So we wanted to hear what the students had to say about the program. And this is what um, one of the, the students said. The sprinter has, sprinter has allowed me to explore and learn more about science in many different forms. During the summer, I learned a lot um, from the lectures, the site visits, and going to the anatomy lab and doing research. The sprinter program allowed me to get great exposure to scientific and professional development, um, a professional environment. In addition, it allowed me to see all of the aspects that go into research and medicine. The sprinter program enhanced my approach to the study of science because it challenged me to dig deeper. We did challenge them. We really did. It was a lot in almost in six weeks, really, and we challenged them. The Sprinter program has made me more confident because of the prep classes we took, like data analysis. It made me more knowledgeable about the different tests that I can run on my data. The Sprinter program um, helped me to become more confident when conducting scientific research and inspired me to pursue a medical research career. The most significant experience I had during my seven weeks was having the continuous support of the staff, other students, and faculty, and, and Miss, Miss, Miss Tina, that, like they called her. And I received enough support to be successful from my mentors because they were always available. So what this tells me is that you can increase um, confidence in students. Um, you can increase their, their, their interest um, to pursue, as we saw from um, Chris and Jaylene. And the social support is incredibly important. You know, these students are constantly hearing, or maybe not even being told directly, but images in the media that they can't. You know, there's report that African Americans are about 13 less likely than Caucasians to receive their first NIH grant, and this is after training, right? We know that less than half, you know, about half, the attrition rate is about 45% or so um, from academia for, for PhD recipients, and we know it's higher among racial and ethnic minorities. So we're constantly hearing in this barrage of, of, of statements that we can't, we can't, we can't, and hopefully this program will show them you can and you did it, you did it. So at the end of this, they had to present their talk and have a written proposal. So lessons learned, it is feasible to implement this program that's multi-component. Um, so it wasn't only the didactic component, it was the case-based components, it was the site visit, um, it was the, the journal club and the discussion. So in the journal club discussions, we gave them the articles that would align with some of the um, topics that we discussed. They had to read it and present it together as a group to their colleagues. Um, the students had positive assessments of the program. Um, so we have to continue to engage the students, because one of the challenges that we're having is I know they're, they're back at school, but to bring them back in. So to really keep them engaged in this program so we can continue to, to support them longitudinally um, to see what the outcomes are. And it's important not only for the grant, but I think it's important for them to know that once you're a Sprinter student, you're always a Sprinter student. Um, we also have to recognize that as much as we loved all of these students, they, there are some hurdles, the GRE and the MCAT. So for students who are interested in going for graduate degrees, that we have to figure out a way of making sure that they, they get the support that they need. Um, and Dr. Daniel Zasaze um, just got, she was here. oh, she's here, um, just got a $3.5 million dollar grant whoo, that will enable us to, to really do this um, through our Emmy program. 
engage the mentors. Um, you know, I, thank you so much to Drs. Patu and Dr. Reinhardt for really just stepping up and saying yes. You know, yes, we can. And, they were very supportive. And then we have to increase this number by 25. Um, so this is Sprinter. Um, it's new. Um, I'm excited about it. Again, we could not have done it without our partners from Medgar Evers, without our partners from SUNY Albany and Brooklyn College. Um, I think you know what was wonderful about this first cohort was that they were selected by the faculty. Like the faculty knew them. They were like, you have to pick the student. Don't worry. Don't look at the grades. Don't look at the grades. Let me tell you about what this student is doing before they come to school, right? Before they come to school, what this student is doing, and then after school, supporting their family, going to work. So we're looking forward to the future of Sprinter. You know, we're about movement, transport, Sprinter. You get the theme here? Yeah, yeah. OK. Um, so I'd really like to thank our mentors, again, Drs. Patu and Dr. Reinhardt, the Sprinter team, Ms. Ajay or Ms. Tina, Ms. Bowman. Dr. Ejini, I don't know if he's here. Oh, yes, for just, we called him one day, we were like, uh, what do you know about sickle cell anemia? <laughs> Can you teach this class on sickle cell anemia? And he did it. Dr. Ejini um, is an aspiring Hemonc fellow, so we thought this would be fitting for him to do. Um, Ms. Daniels Asaze for her support. Uh, Ms. Lakia Maxwell, I don't know if she's here, for helping us with recruitment. Dr. Straker, um, again, our friends from Albany, um, Brooklyn College, and Medgar. So, Thank you, um, and this is our class of 2018.